comedy is now entering something new which is going to be a conversation you know for better or for worse comedians have to make peace with the fact that the journey of a joke is now um joke laughter conversation Hello and welcome to the Dead End Chat Room. I'm your host Manoj Kapil, and joining us today is Emmy nominee and India's busiest comedian, Veer Das. That is uh, a very kind introduction. Thank you. So, Veer, you've been having a pretty good year so far. Congratulations on the Emmy nomination. Thank you, man. Um, it is uh, a strange as trip, but yeah, that's the only way I know to describe it. Yeah. So how does it feel to be competing for honor against like shows like Call Me Agent? It just feels like the the right sort of end to the journey of that special. You know, for for me every special kind of begins with a singular thought or singular intention and the entire special is based around that intention. And for Vidas for India it was I want to take a cool version of India out to the world. you know um that's a very clear pure intention behind that special so to me that's just felt like the end of that acha the world saw it you know ki acha kaam it worked you know <laughs> like that that's the the this thing so I, i think i'm at that's the win for me yeah. is that okay uh, it's been seen and uh, appreciated by some of the world so i noticed in the interviews you did after the nomination came out you said you don't get nominated for many awards back home I do not. I mean, hello, did you forget about forget about the Dead Ant Awards? The ah, uh, huh, you guys, yeah, but I mean, you know, uh, all the you're the only credible award I've been nominated for. <laughs> Excellent, we've got our promo sound by then. Uh, yeah, I love it when when five year olds nominate me for stuff in, <laughs> in the, the, this thing. It's always exciting. I I've, I've received I think two nominations in the last ten years of my life. Maybe uh, one is a film fair. Um, for best supporting and then i think you guys pretty much like those are my two indian nominations so you know <laughs> so how excited are you about getting to attend the ceremony because it's in person this year right have you written your acceptance I'm... speech no no i don't write acceptance speeches at all for anything and i i think it's going to be like a like a really sad dinner you know uh, like the oscars and everything have been like really sad dinners this year i want to meet the people who made call my agent because i think it's one of the best shows in the world right now so i, I definitely want to meet those guys um i'm looking forward to seeing like nawaz again because i know i'll meet him at the, this thing it's been a while since we kind of got together i never met sushmita sen so that should be nice uh, I, i hope you know like i said it's it's just me and my wife and and akash had weird ass who was the ep on the special he's coming all the way so i'm very excited for him because it was his first stand up special that he ever produced um and it got nominated for an emmy so that guy's coming like he's actually making the journey all the way from mumbai you know uh, to do the emmys so like my boy akash i'm very excited for him so i noticed you also put out a call for designers to send your designs and then you pay one at the ceremony what was the idea behind that and like have you figured out a scoring system for how you're going to choose which one I'm not the one doing the scoring. We got a hundred, four hundred and ninety-five emails, uh, and uh, the, the one thing that I told Weirdas was just make sure that they're not successful yet, so that they actually need this, you know, uh, because you otherwise you could have just gone with the whoever whoever designer, right? The entire special has been kind of a, a product of sort of unapologetic humility, you know. Uh, we. there was no stage we took away the stage there, there was no set we just had a door behind us there was no venue it was literally a black box and we used the audience as our set so we lit stand up comedy faces you know uh, deliberately lit them but people deliberately try and keep them in the dark so have i um you know there's no costume the whole thing cost like 2000 rupees on amazon literally to to buy that stuff jyoti's included i think maybe Three grand or something, so it feels disingenuous to kind of be like, okay, now uh, let me get a Kunal Rawal or a you know uh, or a whoever Manish Malhotra or someone to give me something that costs more than than the set of my entire special uh, for for the Emmys. So it just feels like the continuation of that. I'm also recently 
I don't think minimalism is the right word for it because I'm terribly privileged. But essentialism maybe is is the the way that I describe it. I have eight T-shirts and two pairs of pants, and I'm traveling the world with that. So I'm trying to be as sustainable as I can. The rule is, if I buy a new piece of clothing, I give away a piece of clothing to somebody who needs it as well, so that the total clothing never changes. So this is in keeping with that as well. So a lot of the brands that we're looking at are sustainable fashion brands, or a lot of the designers that we're looking at are sustainable fashion designers, and they're just kids, man. You know, uh, who need like a you know a leg up. Or, so I'll pay them for it. We'll put their name out there, and then we'll sell the outfit. and hopefully it will get them some traction yeah i noticed you gave away a lot of stuff recently for the thrift yeah. store and bandra to also you know put up the sale uh, yeah i i sold everything i own in the last 10 years uh, i've had sort of a life restart and the new shows very much about that as well mm-hmm. it's so just kind of traveling the world and learning to be funny again but from a completely different perspective yeah so coming to the new shows you're currently in la uh, as part yes. of the manic man world tour right Yeah, uh, yeah. How does it feel to be back on the road? It's it's starting to feel good, you know. I had sea legs for a while, you know, shaky legs, you know, because I hadn't done stand up for over eighteen months for anybody outside of a forest, right? Uh, and thirty people, so to suddenly be playing for like three hundred or eight hundred or whatever, I'm like, oh shit, this is really fast, you know. And they're really excited because they're like, let's catch COVID and laugh tonight. Um, so. it's starting to feel like it has dynamics uh, and and for me typically i'm not happy with the show i'm just not happy with the show uh pretty much uh, in your typical comedian archetype uh, at least until 6 months in so i'm at month 1 there's going to be a while before mm. i'm like okay this is a good show so right now you're still tightening and like tweaking stuff as you go i'm still writing so i'm i'm still doing an hour of writing every day and trying that shit out and putting it like i have a 20 minute spot in the improv tonight which will be like 2 minutes of safety tagda shit and then just 18 minutes of new shit we'll see and so can you give us an idea of what this show is about um the show's about kind of um battling your mind is is the only way that i can describe it like battling the overthinker's mind and the only way of doing that is to set yourself free from everything so that you're a blank slate ready for good memories that's so it's about selling your house and selling all your possessions and canceling all your plans and paying off your debt and literally traveling the world with one suitcase um so that you can wage this battle against your brain uh, is kind of what the show's about you you did manage to get out a netflix special last year in the middle of the pandemic as well so is this like what's the timeline from this to special number 5 now well i i had no intention of doing a special last year i'll be very honest you know and definitely not a netflix special i just wanted to raise money and that's what ended up happening you know so with that special you know at some point when i was doing those fundraising shows and i think we can all agree zoom comedy fucking sucks you know it's a terrible way to do stand up um i was like acha there's this conversation here you know where I don't know if I'll hit a moment in my life as an artist where there'll be unequivocal global common ground ever again. You know where it felt like the perfect joke setup that worked anywhere in the world. You know, but yeah. except instead of that being something frivolous like well, airlines are uncomfortable or some shit like that, it was tragic and sublime and poignant, and it and it got real responses. And and I think what ended up happening was. I used to do that, you know. What are you going to do when the pandemic ends? Just to warm people up, and then suddenly I started getting these real responses, right? Which is, uh, I meet my mother, or you know, I'm I'm going to bury my dog, or, you know, etc., etc., etc. And then you kind of sit back and go, oh, "Fuck this! This isn't crowd work anymore. This is something else. This is something very real, and I should be smart enough to capture it." <laughs> so Netflix, dude, I have one SLR camera. Uh, you know that i literally put on a stack of books and pointed towards myself like we might be the cheapest comedy special ever produced you know so like that's a netflix special that cost 22000 rupees if that you know to produce um which is more than new york less than new york comics sometimes get paid for like their first corporate gig yeah. uh, etc you know because after veerdas for india i was done i was like okay i'm just going to 
you know, I'll work on this manic man show. I'm going to not do a special for a while because I do think you should pace yourself out. And I had a pretty quick run. And luckily, I'd pulled off the fact that they weren't similar to each other at all. You know, like uh, Ravina and I have always talked about this, which is I always hate the same comedian, fancier suit, bigger theater, you know, uh, a journey of specials. Yeah. So at least a broad understanding was an intercut between, you know, two cities and losing it was a proper American special. And Deirdas for India was a proper Indian theatrical piece, you know. So I was like, OK, I pulled it off. None of them are similar to each other. Now let me chill for a while. Then this happened, we raised a bunch of money and Netflix was like we wanted. So, and I'm in business with them anyway. So that's kind of how that happened. But there's, there's no like intention of putting out a comedy special in the, in the pandemic at all. So, but next one. Next one, dude, I, I, I think you need to have shit happen to you right now, you know, because it's a weird one. And I'm talking to the audience about it as well, where... It's disingenuous to pretend like the entire world hasn't been through something and you're just coming off of something. And yet it's very pandery and self-indulgent to not, uh, to lean into your pain, you know, too much. And be like, oh, they ko, meri tanhai pandemic ka tumhari upar dalta hu. So good comics are going to meander between those two things and find the perfect balance. And I think that perfect balance will come from like yeah. life experience. And ironically, in the last special where we all experienced the same shit and that's what counted, that's what's not working for comedy anymore. You know, when you go out and you're like, hey, so masks and vaccines and people are like, oh, fuck off, please. You know, uh, like there's enough chatter about this on the news, but both of you haven't gone through enough. You know, uh, or enough different shit the, that you can bring something new to the table. So right now, that's what this show is about. It's about traveling the world and just saying yes to everything. Um, yes to any kind of meal. Yes to any kind of life experience. Which also, as you get older, as a comic becomes tougher and tougher to do. You know, we, we all hate the comic who's like, you know, I was, I was at this, uh, I was in, uh, in my jet, or I was flying for, fuck you, dude. You know, the, the, the comic that runs out of life experience. So this is me very much going, no, I'm going to experience shit for a while. So let some shit happen to me. Um, and then we'll, we'll go from there. That's when it will start to feel like a special. Some shit has been happening to you. You're in a Judd Apatow film uh, and you're yeah. working with Kanjali and Fred Armisen, Maria Bakalova. I mean, there's a long list of names I've written down here. So tell me a bit about the film. Is there anything you can tell us about the role that you're playing? It was one of those situations where I had auditioned for something else that they were doing and it didn't end up working out. And then Judd Apatow just literally called me and he's like, hey man, I think you're really funny. Can I create something for you in this movie? So I showed up day one with not a line in the script, literally. Um, and improvised 24 days, 25 days of shooting, completely. Um, so for me, it was very much like just going back to comedy college, you know, because it's the Olympics, right? Everybody, there's a heavy hitter, severely experienced, etc. Leslie Mann or Keegan or Fred Armisen, etc. That's meant to learn. You know, because I was directing something immediately after. So I was like, if I'm in three scenes in this thing, or if I'm in nine scenes in this thing, let me go and be a part of this process and just learn from these people. And it really did. It, it was a wonderful sort of uh, invigorating experience. Who among them were like the most exciting you know, people to see in action? They're all great. You know, what he does really well. And, and I think what I wish we did more of and intend to do more of is everybody's funny for a different reason. And that's something you don't see very often, you know, in great comedies, uh, especially filmic comedies, everybody's funny for a very, very different reason and for a very, very different intention. And I think he's made movies. We've made movies where everybody's like same, same funny. Go, go, are gone. Everybody in go, go, are gone is kind of same, same funny. We've adopted a madness that is like Rajan DK's tone of humor, but here, to have an ensemble, like this is an ensemble of 19 people in this movie. So to have everybody be funny for a very yeah. distinct reason with a different tonality is a really tough thing to pull off. You've also been putting out the 10 on 10 since last year. It's a very yeah. interesting little format where you take auditions. So you would have probably avoided it maybe a Netflix special. Or, you know, or maybe even have avoided a few years ago. 
Uh, I I don't I don't know if I w- if I would have wouldn't have like Netflix has yet to ask me to change a joke or to cut yeah. a joke or anything like that. So we have a pretty good working relationship that way. What I meant by that is is stuff that perhaps a few years ago not a lot of comedians were really going to devote that much time to. I think that has also changed to a certain extent, partly because of how sort of embattled and divisive anyone talking about these topics has become. I I do agree with you and I do disagree with you as well. Like I I think the reason for for me to do them is yeah. uh you know they're all new material. Like that's what a lot of people don't know about the 10 on 10s is yeah. they're written on Friday and filmed on Saturday on Sun or Sunday in a pandemic. So you don't get to work out you know jokes or anything like that. So for that reason yeah. they end up becoming these very kind of uh they're not stand up stand up they're kind of more spoken word or mon- you know I, i don't know if there's a word for them just yet but they you know uh if you like them you'd call them stand ups and if you hate them you'd call them ted talks and i, I think that's how comedy works right now yeah i think but that's become mostly, a like yeah. a more common format to see over the last few years in mainstream yeah, comedy yeah but I, i i think most people aren't divided about that stuff to be honest like if if you like twitter is really kind of a bubble and social yeah. media is kind of a bubble with you know these sections but if you really go a little bit wider and broader in your audience you'll realize that most people just want to pay their bell, bills and be secure and go to bed and can largely agree on what is right and wrong you know and so i brought that up because 10 on 10 got you uh, i mean got mentioned in variety sort of co- uh, comedy impact report uh yes and I mean in terms of your own perspective how much of a sort of impact you think they've had how much of a conversation do you think these um, episodes are starting like do you get that sort of positive feedback do you think uh, do you even think in terms of impact is that something that's of a concern to you or is it just you saying what you want to say the uh, it's me the it's it's me kind of learning from my audience that's really it it's pushing myself into new uncomfortable ground you know impact to do the Fuck knows where you're going to make an impact. It's, you cannot predict these things, right? You can do three Netflix specials and uh, think that nobody has seen them, and then one gets nominated for an Emmy like a year later, and you discover, and then suddenly you can carry your own speaker and a microphone up a bloody hill, and the New York Times is writing about that, or Vulture is writing about that, or Variety is writing about that. So you can't predict these things, you know. With Ten on Ten, where I was coming from was, I hadn't watched a full special in a really long time. and it's possibly because i was also writing stand up and when i'm writing stand up i watch zero stand up so i haven't watched any stand up outside of like maybe you know, a little bit of the new chapel and a couple of other things for 8 months you know because i've been working on a show but also i, I feel like stand up always turns into iconic bits right so there's the carlin bit or there's the the prior bit etc etc that you have to see And I was like, can I take my time and create ten bits that kind of stand the test of time? Then I was like, okay, where do they have to come from? They have to come from the audience. You know, the audience has to tell me what they have to be about. If they're just from me, it's never going to work. And then it has to be around uncomfortable stuff. You know, that's uh, it's unapologetically around uncomfortable stuff. But take the time to go at it from different angles. You know, so if you're making a freedom of speech video. take 20 minutes and really kind of go at it from every angle that you can perceive and see what happens you know or death for instance etc and so the discomfort um or rather that is an uncomfortable topic is not the only problem it also sort of opens you up to certain risks legal uh possibly even physical and you've tweeted before about all the sort of legal notices that you've had to deal with Hasbrook had a yeah. court case. I'm sure you had a few more. Uh, the Hasbrook one, you managed to get a pretty solid judgment as well. Judgment. But how do you yeah. how do you sort of? I mean, how do you navigate that? But also, what sort of effect does it have? I think on on you know, on what Indian comics today think it's safe to put out and it's not. I mean, is there the I, chilling I effect that they obviously want to create? Is I that know, really I, happening? I know that they're making an example of a few of us to you know to to spread a wider message. I don't think it's working, you know. Uh, for the large part, I think most Indian comics are still pretty um, brave. I I don't know, you know. I I don't think about it. I'm usually by the time I'm dealing with one legal notice here, I'm writing something else, and and that's really a byproduct of privilege, right? Uh, and just 
having gotten myself to a point where I can afford the legal fees to go into this stuff. And let's be clear, it costs a fuck ton of money, to, which is also how they get you because they have very deep pockets and you can't match pockets that are that deep. I remember with the Hasmukh, like high court hearing, I didn't want to join the stream. You know, that's something that was important to me. And my team was like, do you want to? And I was like, no, because if there's an image of a comedian in court, you know, even albeit electronically, that is immortalized in a certain sense. You know, uh, that's a win for them, even whether I win that case or not. A comedian in a court hearing, etc., is a win for the other side. Mm. So I'm not going to give them that satisfaction. Um, I tweet occasionally about, you know, the legal troubles and all of that stuff, but I haven't made a huge deal of it. You know, uh, in terms of it's not a part of my Twitter every day. I'm not trying to position myself as like a crusader or anything. I just want to keep telling jokes about whatever I want to keep telling jokes about. So the focus is always what's my next joke. You know, because I feel like drama earns you applause for like a week or two, then you still got to get back to jokes, you know, and that's really what they're trying to keep you from um, is is writing more jokes. So I was trying to come back to that pretty fast. If you can afford it, then it kind of becomes a cost of doing business with a slight risk that it could get worse. But generally, that's how you're treating it. I, I just don't see the benefit. Like, you know, anything that benefits a comedian is going to come from good jokes. That's it. You know, attention lasts five minutes. Um, uh, controversy lasts five minutes. Everything lasts. A hit movie lasts five minutes in stand up. You know, the, we've all been at the, the club where the, the famous comedian has popped in and the audience is like, oh my God. And then three minutes in, they're like, okay, now I need good jokes because I, I don't care what you did five minutes ago. So, really, that's my focus is what's the next good joke? So yeah, we, I remember winning a court case and even saying, I'm not going to write about this for a while because I just want, I just, I just don't want to get tainted in the narrative that they want me to be a part of. So with 10 on 10 specifically, some of them have gone well, some of them have not gone well, some of them have had responses, some of them have not had responses. But largely, I think the audience gets that you're trying something new and that you'll learn with them and that you'll stumble, you know? Uh, the, the idea isn't to get like everybody to watch it. It's to get just this group of people who understand this is what you're trying to do. You know, that, that, that's the best you can hope for. So what did you think of the Dave Chappelle special? Comedy is now entering something new, which is going to be a conversation. You know, for better or for worse. Comedians have to make peace with the fact that the journey of a joke is now um, joke, laughter, conversation you know because stand-up has started to mean something more than it used to mean before right artists like Chappelle are responsible for that as well the fact that stand-up is meaningful and poignant and you know and people want to have a, a conversation around it so you just got to be open to the conversation so I, th I think a lot of your established guard and old guard of stand-up are used to saying what they need to say and then that's that you know but now you're accessible, you know, and now there is a conversation. So you got to be open to the conversation. So I think what you're seeing is a joke that has been cracked yeah. and another side responding with exactly the same relentlessness as the joke has been cracked, you know, and I'll always endorse that conversation and a good comedian should always learn from that conversation. Now, keep in mind, a conversation isn't you should cease to exist. I'm going to burn your house down coming for you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. A conversation is, I'm offended. And that's the beginning of a conversation. Yeah. I'm upset. That's the beginning of a conversation. Here's what you could have done better. Here's why. Here's what I think is wrong. Here's a problem. Here's what you're not seeing happens down the line when you say something like that. All good things to learn from. You know. So, if I'm going to take your money, I'm going to be open to your conversation. You know, I'll always let you respond to what I have to say, I'll never let you tell me what I can and cannot say. Because I would never let, let I would never tell you what you should or should not laugh at. That's neither one of our jobs. If I'm going to take your money, I'll be open to your conversation as long as it's respectful and within the bounds of the law. A conversation. That's it. Yeah. I think like in personally, like 
one thing was like, I mean, Dave Chappelle, someone who walked away from a million dollar show because he thought people were not taking his jokes or laughing at his jokes in the spirit that he intended them, right? In part. Mm-hmm. Uh, because white people were looking at his Chappelle show stuff and uh, uh, racists were laughing at it and not getting the joke. Yeah. It feels very weird that the same situation is happening now, but because it's a different group and because I think uh, the sort of situation he is in is different. He's not making that that connection. In the sense, he's not he's not willing to think of how other people look at his jokes and respond to them in this situation. You'd be hard pressed to find a comedian who will critique another comedian's craft. You know, because I'm 14 years in. That's a guy who's 30 years in. You know, Bill Burr is entirely himself on stage right now. Entirely. Knows his voice. He's 25, 30 years in. You know, so, you know, asking me what I think of their craft is like asking a bacha what he thinks of a professional cricketer. You know, or somebody who's playing high school cricket, etc. I do think that there is a feedback loop. And I do think sometimes as comedians, we make these things bigger uh, in our mind than they are. I'll give you an example. Jennifer Lawrence stumbles sometimes and she's clumsy, right? And some and, and I'll see her give an interview and where she's like, oh, everybody knows that I'm clumsy, you know? And I'm like, no, no, everybody doesn't know that you're clumsy. The large portion of the world just knows you as a, a talented actor. And doesn't know that you're clumsy at all. So sometimes a comedian can be like, oh, everybody knows that I'm having this struggle with this this uh, one group or this or that, etc., etc. Or that, you know, people wrote stuff about my last special and now I'm going to... No, nobody knows. Uh, just make us laugh. That's sometimes it. as a critic, you know? I wish people paid as much attention to what I write as the people I'm writing about seem to think. The, the critique of comedy is a tough one. You know, because a, a film critic can go in because they love movies, right? And you can be like, I love movies. And you should watch this movie because of this. Or you, you know, uh, or here's what I didn't like about this movie because I love movies, right? For some reason, it's now turned into don't watch this fucking movie because of blah, 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 blah. And and you're a critic, so you know that that was never the job of a critic. It was, I love this. Here's what I love about it. Here's what I didn't like about it. But I always love this art form. Right. That's a, a constant. Um, so with comedy, I know that most critics go in as, as like comedy fan people. Right. But it's an involuntary response. Like film is a voluntary response. You know, so in comedy, there's yeah. either I made you laugh or didn't make you laugh. You know, film is like good, bad moments, nuance, yay, bo, etc, etc, etc. Comedy is either haha or, you know, it's so incredibly subjective. So to articulate that is a tough thing, I would imagine, for a critic. You gave up, you gave up your house in Bombay. Uh, yeah. Like you said, you drastically reduced your wardrobe, given away much of what you own, and you take it off on a whole tour. So what's the plan yeah. now? Are you ever planning on coming back? Oh yeah, for sure, man. I'm going to have a pretty gigantic India tour the minute we can get, you know, uh, permissions. And I'm going to film some stuff around it as well. I just ended up doing a series, uh, I acted a lot in the last like sort of 12 months and you know I love acting but it's a lot of conversations about protein shakes and intermittent fasting and you know all of that stuff etc so I just needed to like be out on tour and drink some beer and and experience some real life which I'm doing now um I don't fully know what will come after the tours um there's an American movie there's an American TV show there's an Indian movie and any one of those things could go first so I mean Maybe it's time for a break. <laughs> but this is the break. Like that's what I always... <laughs> guys, I've worked very, very hard to be... Th- like I'm not doing a single thing I don't love. And that's a extremely blessed place to be. And that comes from 10 years of doing a lot of stuff where the market expected you to do that stuff and you thought it was good. And then you discovered, oh shit, I just kind of need to DIY. But then there was no takers for DIY, you know. And so I'm finally in a space where there's takers for DIY. And really, nobody's better at DIY than stand-ups, if you think about it. You know, in any uh, other profession that we go into, there ain't no more DIY people than us, you know. So they're finally takers for my DIY. Why would I slow down now? Now is when you go. 
that's uh, that's all the question I have. Thank you so much for uh, coming on to the show. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, man. I had a good time.